Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of the show, we talk about one simple thing you can do today to improve muscle growth, fat loss, and your overall health. We also talk about a popular muscle building supplement that can actually improve your memory. There is no debate. There's no debate anywhere. In the second half of the show, we coach three live callers on questions such as, my energy crashes after eating carbs. What can I do to prevent this? I want to lose body fat. Should I do more cardio? And I'm lifting weights, but I'm not dropping body fat. What's going on? Finally, do you need a little fitness information snack every once in a while? Hey, let's say you're taking a little break at work and you need to get like five minutes of fitness information in. Well, we have your back over at Mind Pump Clips. Go over there and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. There's literally one thing you can do that will significantly impact in a positive way, muscle growth, strength, recovery, and fat loss. Steroids. Not that. It's one thing only. One other thing. <laughs> and that is to improve your sleep quality uh, and even sleep a little bit more. Just doing that alone, most of the time, will get your results moving in a positive direction. So if I sleep a lot, I'll look like Arnold. Not, <laughs> not exactly. Oh. Uh, no, you know what's, you know what's uh, interesting about this is for the vast majority of people, because most of us have suboptimal sleep, or we have some days where they're great, maybe not so great other times. And we're really good at, humans are really good at, at operating at suboptimal sleep. So, and once you get used to it, you tend to think, I'm okay. But literally, I used to do this with clients. If I just focus on their sleep and had them do a sleep routine, had, to, had them really schedule that they're going to sleep you know, for eight and a half hours, make sure that, and we'll get into this, make sure that on the weekends they keep the same schedule so they don't get jet lagged on Monday, and we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. You would see fat loss start to happen, libido start to go up, strength start to go up. I mean, it's such a, it sounds so simple that I think a lot of people just discredit it because it's like, ah, oh, it's sleep. What's the big deal? Yeah. I feel okay. But no, it makes a huge difference. And you don't have to change anything else, just that. You know what's interesting is there's like a saying, like abs are made in the kitchen. Yeah. You know, why isn't there like a muscles are made, uh, you know. In the bedroom? Uh, yeah, in, in the bedroom or at night or sleep. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know, like weird. you guys come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> there's no catchy phrase for that. But it really is like that's where all the magic happens. Obviously, you're going to stimulate it throughout the day and, you know, put the work in. But your body needs um, you know, all of the, the active building materials and everything. And then the, the proper amount of recovery is really what takes you, uh, to that place you want to go. Okay. So if this is true, would you stand behind an argument like this, that building a good sleep, sleep routine and, or even utilizing good sleep aids that help you get a better night's rest could result in more muscle than even something as 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 powerful and as well studied as something like creatine. Yeah, for your muscle building goals. Yeah. It, okay. So poor sleep. Let's go in the opposite direction, right? Poor sleep has a profound effect on your hormones, on your anabolic hormones. Studies will show that like one or two nights of poor sleep in men will dramatically lower testosterone. Cortisol goes through the roof in both men and women. You see this imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. Growth hormone is thrown off. So just the hormones alone. You, you, saw, you start to see problems. Memory deficiencies happen with one night of poor sleep. Insanity happens with, I think, like three or four nights of no sleep. They've done studies on this where you actually start to, like a, like a large percentage of people actually start to become insane. Mm -hmm. It's such a, a powerful thing. First off, uh, this, this gives you a hint as to how essential sleep is. Evolution hasn't figured out how to get rid of it. And you might think, well, why would evolution want to do that? Well, think about it. For eight hours a night, you're doing nothing. You're not gathering food. You're not building shelter. You're not hunting you're or protecting as yourself. As vulnerable as can be. You become unconscious. If sleep wasn't one of the most important things ever, evolution would have figured out a way to keep us uh, from not sleeping. But almost every creature that I think that we know of sleeps in some way, shape, or another. It's extremely important. And uh, lack of sleep has been shown to change behaviors. So lack of sleep increases cravings for certain foods, changes, uh, influences our impulsivity. Um, and a lot of people think, well, yeah, that's if I get like really terrible sleep. But it could be like, you know, ideal might be eight hours of sleep and you get seven every single night or six and a half. This is actually where people tend to fall, about six and a half hours of good sleep. And I know what people do is they look at the time they go to bed and then they count the hours from there. That's actually really what you want to do is count the time you fall asleep and then when you wake up and it's usually takes people about 10 to 15 minutes to really start to fall asleep. So you want to add that in there 
And I tell people to aim for eight and a half hours of sleep because then we tend to fall back to about seven hours and 45 minutes or eight hours. Um, now here's the other one. This one's a huge one that I didn't figure out till later. I don't remember where I heard this, but this, I don't remember who it was that said this, but they said, you know, it's funny. People go to bed at, let's say 10 o'clock every night. And then Friday night comes around and they're like, Oh, I'll sleep in Saturday. So I'll go to bed at midnight and then I'll go to bed again, you know, one o'clock in the morning, Saturday night. Cause I'll sleep in on Sunday. And then Monday comes around. They got to wake up early for work. Everybody feels like dog crap. And it's because you literally created jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah. It's you've the same exact process, right? You've, you've changed your <laughs> circadian rhythm yeah. and that takes like a couple days to adjust. And you're doing that to yourself every single week. So uh, like one massive powerful hack is to go to bed and wake at the same time every single day, even on the weekends. It's like diet. It's like everybody's good Monday through Friday with their diet and Saturday, Sunday screw up and they can't figure out why they can't burn body fat. Same thing with sleep. Now I asked the question about the comparing creatine to like sleep aid type of supplements because today we have a commercial for Ned and I know that they just recently created another sleep aid uh, product yeah. and mellow has been like life changing for me as far as uh, my ability to fall asleep and then get better quality sleep. Um, do you know, I haven't tried the product out, so I don't know anything about it. Like, I just know it's part of their sleep, their sleep category. Mm -hmm. Again, I think I saw that it has magnesium in it, which that excites me because I think that was obviously what was so, so powerful for me in mellow that made such a difference. So it's got that and, and, and in conjunction with some other, uh, herbs and stuff. What's yeah, it, it's what's up it? there. So, okay. So here's what's, uh, so just on that note, so I gave my parents, um, mellow. And I had them try it and they, my mom texted me this morning. She's like, do you have more of that? Like your dad and I are getting some of the best sleep that we've had in a long time. So Mellow is phenomenal. The difference between Ned's Mellow and their new product called Shut Eye Chai is that the Shut, Shut Eye, Eye Chai, Chai also has <laughs> ashwagandha, chamomile. It's got uh, dandelion root. Um, it's got the theanine, but so does Mellow. And it's got the magnesium, but so does Mellow. So what it, what they've added to this were these kind of natural adaptogenic compounds known to help relax the body. Now, these are different than like taking something that makes you drowsy or, you know, uh, kind of in, like melatonin or something like that. These compounds have adaptogenic properties. They actually help the body deal with stress. They're not themselves. Like you can have chamomile and ashwagandha earlier in the day. It's not going to make you fall asleep. But through using them on a relatively consistent basis, it does improve your body's ability to deal with stress. So it's, that's why it's called an adaptogenic. Yeah. Um, and it improves sleep through that process. So it's it's like mellow, but then they've put these other things in it uh, to make it even more, I guess, long-term effective. Now, pardon my ignorance, but uh, in terms of chai, is chai specifically a spice or is it a combination of a bunch of spices? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe Doug knows. I don't know. The, How do you not know that? I mean, I know what chai tea is. <laughs> it is a combination of spices, uh, and that's what they've put in here, like cardamom, cinnamon, clove, that type of thing. Yeah. So, but I don't know the exact, you know, uh, ingredients that typically go into chai. Okay. I like the taste. Yeah, because I was talking. Actually, I got a chance to to talk with the guys from Ned at our Christmas party quite a bit. And what's cool about what they do is they really want to get like a hands-on with any of these products. They usually go wherever like the, the source or the root of it is. So okay. they actually went to India. They went to India? Yeah. Oh, was, that's cool. It, it's Hassam or I forget the region of India. Um, but uh, they traveled all the way there. And like he was telling me all these crazy stories about who they met and like what kind of spices they tried through that whole process. But it was like a very hands-on experience that they had with it and then we're able to source you know what they really yeah. liked that's, that's what cool. i like about so here's guys. some answers for you oh thanks okay. uh, yeah. so chai is actually the hindi word for tea so there you go oh. but, <laughs> okay but typically the traditional way is to take black tea mix it with strong spices like cinnamon cardamom cloves ginger black now, peppercorns now doesn't tea normally naturally come with caffeine too or depends on the type of tea so i'm assuming this doesn't because that wouldn't no. make a lot of sense to have that caffeine. would be terrible yeah right? We put caffeine in our sleep formula. <laughs> yeah, I thought I thought time. most I thought most chais actually naturally had caffeine. If in it. black tea has caffeine, green tea has caffeine, but like uh, like chamomile. Yeah. So it, I would say it's more chai spices that they put yeah. in there. There's no tea that I can see in this. Yeah. Ah, so. You know, I, I'll tell you what. Um, it's what's interesting about this is, and I ignored this forever as a kid. So I, you guys know, I dived into like muscle building 
you know, methodologies and I dived into like how the old time strongman worked out and how did people, what did they say to do back before, you know, even anabolic steroids existed and supplements existed. And they always said a few different things, all of them. They all said, eat lots of, uh, like eat lots of meat and eggs. And they talked about drinking milk and heavy cream. They talked about training the full body three days a week, not beating yourself up. They would say things like leave some in the tank for not in the tank, but they, they use different verb verbiage, but basically allow yourself to be able to work out hard again a couple days later. And then this is what they always, always said to prioritize restful sleep every single night. Which one of those things do you think I ignored as a kid? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. The last one. But they all Always. said it every single one. You read any book, any any publication from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And by the way, these strong men or or these strength athletes had feats of strength that would blow anybody away. Like if you, like a one-arm bent press with 300 pounds. Like that's mm -hmm. a barbell above like above your head with one arm, 300 pounds. Like insane feats of strength. They looked incredible. And they all emphasize like good night's sleep, good night's sleep, good night's sleep. What do you th what do you think it is that that keeps us? I mean, we've known it for forever, and it's not like even when I became a trainer, like I didn't hear that. It wasn't like it was a new science that oh, we get great sleep and it makes yeah. a huge difference. Why do we tend to ignore that if it's that powerful, that beneficial towards our results and goal? Why is it never even make anybody's top five list of what they focus? There's on? a few different reasons. This it's is actually so productivity driven. Well, it's not. Yes, and there's a few different reasons. It's really interesting when you look into this. When electricity was invented, so before electricity was invented, the sun went down. It was dark, and you used candlelight. But if you've ever had a house lit up by candles, it's kind of dark, and it does make you sleepy. People used to sleep a lot more. Mm. They also were much more physically exhausted. So yeah. people were ready to go to bed at nine o'clock. Now we're so physically inactive today that you get this kind of wired, you know, it's kind of wired, tired uh, energy. Um, and if you've ever been on a computer all day long and it's time to go to bed and notice you can't sleep, that's kind of what's happening. They got more sunlight, so we get less sunlight. Um, and we have more ways to fill the time. Back in those days when it was dark outside, and you had candlelight, like, what are you going to do? You're going to go work? You're going to go, well, you're not going to really do anything. So I guess you could read a book by candlelight. You ever try to read a book by candlelight? You're going to be asleep in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now you got TV, you got your phone. In fact, with uh, like tablets and phones and computers, sleep has gotten worse, not better because people are, are keeping themselves up. So you combine all those things together and it's like, we're, we're this like walking zombies, you know? Like I do yeah. this to my kids. I see my, my son will, will complain about not being able to sleep, even though he hasn't been doing anything all day long. I'm like, oh, it's because you haven't seen the sun. So you're like a vampire right? and you're not physically. So I'll take him on a hike, have a move, go outside. And then I'll be like, how did you sleep last night? Oh, I slept really good. Yeah. It's that, it's that weird combination. It's that like wired energy that, that you don't uh, express. And then, you know, and then that kind of just, it's this low level kind of stress. You just, you just carry with you and it goes with you into the next day. And then the next day after that. And it's, it's interesting to me. And two, like, uh, in terms of like your immune system, like, you know how it is when you're run down, oh, right? Yeah. It's like, you're I just susceptible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, and so there's just all these effects of like not being fully recovered that, uh, you know, our body and then not getting sunlight on top of that. It's like, we're just working against our, our body I, right now. I, I see a huge difference. It's one of the worst feelings is to feel uh, mentally exhausted, but not physically exhausted. It, yeah. it is yeah. like a recipe for the worst sleep ever. I've many times have felt where, you know, we, especially when we do these things where we talk a lot, where we talk for five, six hours in a day, like I've got a headache, I feel so. And we're in here with the electric. Yeah, the yeah. Lamp but I haven't us. done anything really physical and so my my body is not that exhausted but my mind is and so then you lay there and you're so restless and then you get this awful sleep even though you feel it's like so you should be oh it's the it's the worst i yeah. know a huge difference and then just simply getting a good workout earlier in the day and getting outside for just a small period of time makes a, a tremendous difference so think of it this way today you have to go out of your way you have to plan to be active yeah. in modern times. Yeah. That this wasn't the case not that long ago. A couple generations back, 
you know, if I if I told my great great grandfather, yeah, I go lift heavy things and put them down, and he's like, well, what are you building? Well, I just do that for myself. He'd be like, this is so weird. Why are people doing this? Because that's what I do for yeah, work, are, right? Are you mental? Yeah. So you have to plan <laughs> physical activity. You have to plan to not overeat. This also didn't exist not that long ago, and sleep was not something you had to plan to have uh, be good in the past because it just happened. It got dark. Like, try this out. For anybody who's, who's, who's listening to me, try this out. Do something really physical all day long. Then when you come home and it gets dark, don't turn on your lights and use candles and tell me your ass isn't going to be asleep by 9 p.m. Yeah. It just naturally happens. Yeah. So my point with all of this is you have to plan to have good sleep. That means you should have a sleep routine. So maybe two hours before bed, you dim the lights. Or So what I have, or I have uh, Himalayan salt lamps. I have these little night lights and salt lamps. And we dim everything. And so it's just kind of nice and dark and glowy in the house. That makes a huge difference. Or where, you know, blue light blockers is, is another alternative. Um, I don't eat right before bed. I wait at least an hour and a half or two hours before. And then I'll use supplements or things to help, like things with magnesium and theanine, which help calm the brain, help calm the mind. Um, and if you do that on a consistent basis, I promise you, you'll you'll notice brand new gains in your body. Strong. In fact, do this for two days, and I bet mo many people will hit close to PRs in the gym. It just makes a huge difference. All right, here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Aesthetic. This is a bodybuilding-inspired workout program, and here's how you can enter to win. Make sure you leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and then turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment and declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're not going to let you know any other way in the comment section that you won free access to MAPS Aesthetic. We also got a sale going on right now. Check this out. It's the at-home holiday bundle. Okay, so it's MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Suspension, MAPS Prime, and the No BS Six-Pack Formula all together in a bundle. This would normally retail for over $330, but right now with the special bundle, you get all of them, all of them, for one price, $99.99. That's for all of them. So $99.99 and you get all of them for that one low rate. It's pretty awesome. It's only happening this month. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the des description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. Talking about sleeping, you just reminded me of something that I'm struggling with right now uh, with my son. And I may be afraid that I overcompensated a tiny bit in a direction here, and I'm not sure yet what I'm supposed to do. So I've talked on the podcast many times about uh, Max and him, his environment with Katrina and I, and that he's never seen yelling and fighting, and it's just he's got this unbelievably sweet and sensitive personality, and it's it's powerful how I can just slightly change the tone in my voice and just it will freeze him in his tracks. And last night he, uh, you know, so we have the Nanit cam and it alerts us when he moves or whatever like that. And uh, we now don't, we don't, you know, lock his door. We, in fact, we leave it cracked a little bit. He likes it to where he can see a little bit of light coming in. And that's kind of how we leave him and we go to bed. And a lot of times we go to bed and he's still awake, but he's, he knows that he's supposed to stay in there and he'll normally stay in there, toss around a little bit and then fall asleep. Well, Katrina and I are, are downstairs and we're, we're watching TV, sitting by the fire and stuff. And the, she goes, oh, he's up. And I'm like, is he up, up or like out? She's like, yeah, he's out of the room. And I, so I go running over to meet him before he gets, he's walking from his room. He's like, like, you know, sleep walking almost. And I hear him, daddy, mommy. And he's walking and I, uh, he's coming towards the stairs. I'm hitting the bottom stairs and I'm like stomping intentionally up the stairs so he can hear my, me coming. <laughs> Maximus, you get in bed. I say that and he, Oh, and he turns around and like starts crying, crawls back in his bed, covers himself up. And what I hear a him, shitty dad. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm just like, that's the worst feeling. Isn't it? I, it is. That's and it's like, worst. and I, and I know like I, I'm, I did it intentionally cause I wanted him to yeah. hear me be stern that, Hey, it's bedtime, you yeah. know, it's dead. And, and I don't normally get stern like that with him, but just that, was enough to like make him cry. And he had the, a bad dream or something. And, and the just, cry. He just wanted you to hug him. No, <laughs> there's a different. There's a di By the way, as in, in parents, I know probably can. Uh, I mean, at least I know. I'm sure you guys would agree that I can. I can actually tell a difference in mm. the whine and cry uh, if it's like fear and yeah, sure, yep. right. Yeah. So I I know when it's like trying to get out of bed and just want to make excuses. Shenanigans. Or yes. If it's real. Yeah. Or versus like I really had a nightmare and I'm scared. Well, I can, you can hear the, it in the cry. That's the toughest thing about parenting. It's the it's when you do something and then. 
afterwards you feel like just bad. Like, what did I do? Why did I do that? But so what you're saying is like, I know I made it so like calm. That yes. Even the slightest. So like, I know, I know that's right. Right. I know that that has to be a healthier, better environment. Right. Than the, than chaos and screaming and yelling yeah. around my kid. I know that, but have I taken it? So have I taken it so far and, and so extreme that he's that sensitive to like a, a little bit of a, t I don't know. And so this, as a dad now, I tend to do this where there's things that I, I, I set that I go, okay, I, I'm going to be this type of father or I want to be this type of parent yeah. or I want to work on these things. And I'm wise enough to know that I will, these things that, that are very, very important to me, I'm probably going to overcompensate a little bit probably too much on a lot of things. For example, that's what's nice about having a partner who doesn't always agree on how you want to do things. It was up to me. Max would have two toys. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Type of, so <laughs> throw, I would throw everything else away. Probably not a good idea to do that. It would probably traumatize him if I threw all his One toys. One of them was a calculator. Here, figure shit out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's your first so, toy. <laughs> so thank God for Katrina to, to to balance me out a little bit that way because I would I would probably go too far. Does he though. have, do you, do you have him hang out with a lot of cousins and friends? Yeah. And have other, yeah. Okay, well, there you know, he'll see that. Yeah, I mean, he does. Uh, you know, here's the thing, too, that sometimes kids have a natural disposition, um, and Max definitely is a lover. He's mm -hmm. the sweetest. He's yeah. such a... Aurelius is the same way. Just this loving little kid. Then my brother, my brother has a son, and he's also a lover, but he's also... He's a spitting image of my brother, and he is... This kid will climb and jump. He has no idea of peril. He, he sees no peril. He'll right. jump off... The top of the stairs. He doesn't He's care. Fearless. Totally. Just doesn't even realize it. Whereas Aurelius, I mean, he could be 13 years old. I'll say, don't get out of your crib and you won't. He'll just stand there. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's that also. But I know what you mean, dude. I don't know. I, it's such a weird, like, what do you do? It's a dance. Yeah, I know too. Like just the difference between both of my boys, it's it's substantial in the way that I um, pr present my own voice and carry my voice with them too. So like, you do that. So if you're disciplining Ethan versus Everett, you'll bring different. a different- tone even to each one yeah. of them oh you will yeah oh interesting yeah because yeah much like max like ethan has a little more of a sensitive kind of uh way about him so i i have over throttled and i've learned with him that like it for desired outcome it's really what we're looking at here is like how their their behavior shifts and i don't really have to do a lot i just have to i have to abruptly like i have to get it right away like so i, I like to um interrupt that train of thought and so if, if it's just it's just kind of like a a quick like hey you know and i'll catch him in, in the moment and in the act or or just in his like back talking or something you mm -hmm. know it's like a boop hey like i'm paying attention he's like oh and he, like that's it but with everett i have to like sometimes like because you gotta it shake becomes, him up a little bit more yeah it, yeah it just becomes like a bit more of a of a spiraling like i'm he's already very self deprecating and very like, you know, like punishing himself. I have to break his thought process a little more aggressively mm. uh, and and bring my tone dude, a little I'm, more like. Dude, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people, some people say you got to treat all your kids the same. I don't think that's true at all. Mm -mm. All your kids are going to be different and some you need to push right. and some like my daughter, She's so ambitious. She's so insanely ambitious that if she misses the mark, I don't talk to her about missing the mark. In fact, I do the the like, oh, it's okay. You tried your hardest or whatever. Whereas with my oldest, he gets away with kind of skating sometimes. He's a really sharp kid. Yeah. And the conversations with him might be a little different. Like, no, no, no. You got to push yourself. You're not applying yourself as much. I can't treat them the same because they're, they're Are different. there people that actually think that? That you yeah. should? Really? Yeah, people say that. That's know? so funny because I think that, you know, obviously being a parent is is a leadership role. And in, in leadership, when you have a team of God, people- God, what a great example you just mm -hmm. gave. Yes, you, exactly. You, you, you cannot- You're I not mean, going to manage a team. Exactly. No, you know? no, absolutely not. I mean, there, I mean, we've, I think we've mentioned this before, you know, like Justin's a classic example because we've been together for so long. Like you can't, uh, there's no reason to come down hard if there's something that he fucked up or did something wrong because nobody is harder <laughs> yeah, on him than true. himself. That's true. So coming yeah. at that angle is only going to backfire by, by treating him that way. Then yeah. you have other people on the staff where I've got to kind of wake up that way or else they'll procrastinate on it or they'll put on the, they'll get distracted or they only, and they need to be shook up a little bit. Like, Hey, this is important. This is an issue. And, and they're, they don't take it the same way. Right. So 
I, I yeah, I, I don't think that. I think that's crazy if someone yeah. thinks that you got the, the personalities. Now, what I wanted to know, Justin, is that did you um, did it evolve that way, or do you even think that? your parenting style was different with Ethan early on and that formed him into that way. And so now you have to be different than the way you are ever. Or do you think it's like that was in their DNA? I think that- it was there the whole time. I think that I, um, I think I read it wrong initially. Mm-hmm. And uh, just because of my own, uh, what was modeled to me from my father in um, the stern kind of like energy and the, uh, authoritative kind of presence. And so I've, I've had to like check myself if that's really the, the, the right tool to apply. And it, it, it took a few mistakes really to, to, to form the way that I handle it now, uh, to alter that. So I, I have like tried to alter and be flexible and change, uh, based off of like, like I spun him out a few times because I, like I came in too hot, you know, yeah. and like it didn't, um, it, didn't produce, you know, now, obviously what I wanted. Was he, was he able to communicate that back to you or did you piece it together by the way he react? Like, you're like, Oh shit, that was They're young. I mean, he probably doesn't even know. Yeah. Just saw it, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It was really just reading his reaction for mm-hmm. the most part. And then now they're better at communicating with me. Like, this is how you made me feel. Cause like, I'll come in and I'll discuss it later uh, uh, in terms of like the rhyme and the reason why, you know, if, if I am coming in hot, like I always want them to know, like there's a reason why I did that. And it's not just like I'm reacting to something. You know, you know? it's something that my uh, mom did when I was a kid that was so powerful was that she, I don't remember exactly what she did. This is how powerful it was. I don't remember what she did. I remember her apology afterwards. Right. Where she literally sat me down. You know how powerful it is to have your parent. Yep. Sit down and say. Didn't we just talk to a live caller or a, 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 was it someone at the live event about this? Maybe we, we're talking and and, and then was talking. The lady was talking about something that she did, and I'm like, dude, the best thing is to just Jen Cohen. Oh, it was Jen. It was it was Jen's interview? We talked about this, so that'll yeah. come out right, so yeah. that you guys will hear that. We talked about that in there. Yeah, was, I remember. My yeah. mom literally she apologized, powerful, like, yeah. hey, I, I I totally reacted wrong. I was whatever, and I remember as a kid, like it was so powerful to me um, to do that, and I think that's important to show your kids that you're. You're, you're, uh, what's the word? I don't know. Human? Advanced enough, mature yeah. enough, smart enough. You're modeling to them. Mm-hmm. Like, but you also humility. make mistakes too. Yeah. Of course. But yeah. also like, like if they see that you, cause kids aren't stupid. They're going to know like, oh, my dad made a mistake, my mom, whatever, but they won't even admit to it. Well, now they're going to model that. Right. Yeah, Versus yeah. being self-aware enough to, cause we all mess up, man. I mean, there's, I mean, God, I, there's, there's a few things I remember with my older kids that just still haunt yeah. me. I remember one time my son wouldn't finish his eggs. And he had this habit of not finishing his breakfast. And I sat there and made him eat it. And as he left the table and walked upstairs, he threw up. He was sick. Oh, oh my God. God. And you know how big of an <laughs> you asshole? You feel like a tyrant. You're like, oh, oh man. Like the biggest. I've done the same. Oh, like the biggest jerk uh, of all time. Aurelius recently, yeah. you know, his mom, because we, we have the baby now, right? So we have the infant. And Aurelius is two, so he's a toddler. And he's adjusting to the fact that mom and dad now also have to take care of this infant. So he's kind of, he doesn't have get all the attention like he yeah. was getting before. And he was really acting up. You jump on Jessica when she's holding the baby, this whole thing. So she, you know, I, she didn't snap on him, but she got, you know, she said some stuff and got upset with him. Well, he left and he came back to her and he goes, and he does the sign, you know, for sorry. And he goes, I'm sorry, mama. And she was like, oh my God, <laughs> she was destroyed. And she's yeah. like, listen, but I'm sorry. Mama got mad and upset. I said, you know, I, I spoke to you in a way that I didn't want to, you know, I love you. I mean, he's only two, but. Oh, I tough. was going to ask you if he's if he's going through because that's super common, especially with like a toddler with a, a, a new a new baby in the family is the in, in intentionally acting out because they're losing the attention that they mm-hmm. used to get because they were all of the attention. Are you seeing that happen right now? What it looks like is he he wants. So what I'm what I what we what we're consciously doing to offset that is we include him in helping and everything that we do so that he doesn't feel like his baby sister is taking anything away, but rather he is now a part of taking care of his baby sister as well. So he gets the diaper, gets the wipes, you know, um, you know, kisses her. Hey, well, mama's feeding the baby. Can you, you know, rub her leg or whatever? So he's a part of it, but also with chores, he's even more involved now with chores, which it's great. Sometimes it sucks. Like last night I'm trying to eat my steak 
And he's like, Papa, I want to help you cut, help you cut. So I got to like, he puts his hand on my hand, like every freaking bite. He's got to help me cut my meat, you know? It is a little bit of a double-edged sword because I've been, Seems I've like done this hour. also. And yeah. there's times when you're like in a hurry and you need to get something done. And then he wants to help. Bro, and you're just like, oh shit, everything this I do, take 30 more minutes than I expected. Anything, washing the dishes, cooking, yes. Yes. doing laundry, sweeping. Uh, he's got to help. So I was like, oh great, here we go. It's going to be, you know, one hour, a 10 minute what a, job what a beautiful, What a beautiful lessons though, lessons for ourselves, right? Of yeah. like just to, to be patient, to take time that everything we're always in a hurry for it's like okay you know maybe i do need to just slow down oh yeah. totally yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> aurelius rather than acting out you know what he does is he he tries to act sweet and cute which just makes me feel worse you know like mm. he's not getting attention and he'll make this cute face and you know papa and i love you know and, and hug me and i'm like oh you uh, just want well, my attention buddy <laughs> it's funny Sorry. i even wrote on here a little bit it's somewhat related but like so everett's latest thing is he's really really honing in on my mannerisms and initially I was like dying laughing because it's like, you know, oh, okay, you got me, you know, because I'm, I'm very much that way with them. Like I pick up on uh, when they're frustrated or uh, when they have like certain, like certain sayings that they do, like I'll, I'll use it against them to, to make jokes, yeah. you know, and I'll make fun. And so they're starting to kind of figure out how to like make fun of my laugh and like how to do it. And so are they like, hitting that line of like, oh, yeah, like, enough now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, like, I, you know, they got me when I like, a, like I, I do S, you know, noises when I'm like laughing or like also I'm going to laugh like a hyena. And so anyways, so I, <laughs> he, he, he'll like bust that out now when I'm like frustrated or like, I'm, I'm not like, I'm like, buddy, I'm not in the mood, you know, <laughs> buddy, I'm not in the mood. Oh, he keeps doing it? <laughs> I'm like, I'm about to slap you. you know? <laughs> and it takes like, I'm like seriously like boiling at this point. Courtney looks over me like, mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right, I'm just going to go outside. I'm going to go outside, <laughs> you know, but then they're like pushing, pushing, pushing these days, man. It's pretty funny. I've had those conversations because you got to, you got to show them where the line is. And I've had those conversations. Yeah. I feel Look, like, I feel like Dominico would be a little bit of a smart ass and push that line. He does. He's got but, that wit to But him. now he's older, so he kind of figured it out. But there was a period there where he would go a little too far. And then I, I sat him down. I'm like, listen, I'm your dad. So at the end of the day, you got to show me respect. So I'm cool, but I'm not that cool. So you got to stop. You got to know when <laughs> exactly. to stop. Exactly, yeah. You know, when we start doing that. Uh, that's, that's hilarious. Uh, that's so does Brianna get you? Does she get you like that? Is not she really. Pretty? Yeah. Because I don't get her. Uh, okay. You know, so we kind of have this mm. thing where we just, you know, don't don't play that game. Yeah, you give her a lot of space and latitude. I feel yeah, like. Yeah, my gets. brother. Oh man, he used to give me such a hard time about it. Oh, uh, which is probably why and you don't. To at his all. own kids, mm -hmm. I think at times, and I always felt like I didn't like it. I don't think they like it, so I I don't want to model that for her. Yeah, yeah. there's definitely a fine line, right? But be, be, between like we're having fun, and then the, you make them insecure or whatever about something you're making fun of. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So I could I could see that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so. right now Max is this is so cool. This is, uh, you know we talk a lot about the negative sides of technology and being wary about you know how much screen time and stuff like that and, and 100. Now there is some things that I think are really cool that just we couldn't we didn't have this option so max is finally he's at this age now where you know he knows who his friends are and they and they play and they do stuff so uh this new thing that we can do with him now is we allow him to do you know facetime you know if once once a week or so with like one of his like friends who, like my best friend's son hunter who is like a year older than he is so he's four and the max is three and they facetime play together it's the funniest <laughs> wait, thing. wait 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 that's so adorable oh so it's the great. cutest thing like I got, they like, they, I got like they're playing so he'll so he'll prop it up against the love sack on the iPad and we'll call him. So we'll first call his mom and be like, Hey, is, is Hunter playing? Oh yeah, yeah. They can call and we'll let him talk. And they sit there, have, you know, full on, he gets his transformers <laughs> and his, his, you know, Pokemon's out and they're showing each other like, Oh, this is the new Charmander. And like, it's, what's funny is that Hunter That's amazing. is, Hunter is a year ahead of him. So his conversational skills are, are, are ahead and Max isn't quite there. But what I find so fascinating is that, you know, Hunter still loves communicating with him. And I feel like, dang, that's crazy that Max can't even say half the stuff he can say, but yet they're in their own little world, like playing and showing each other all their toys. And like, yeah, we'll sit, we'll let them do it for like a half hour where they're just sitting there going back and forth. Wow. It's cool to, it's really cool yeah, to watch. Yeah, Aurelius has it. His, his relationship with his Nana, which is uh, uh, Jessica's mom, is almost entirely through FaceTime. And he has a relationship with her. Yeah. They get on the FaceTime, they talk, they hang out. So when she comes to visit, 
He runs right to her, recognize her. It's not like she's a like a person that he's like a stranger. Yeah, we've been able to do this with all of our family now. It's become something that Katrina is is incorporated with, like my mom, who we don't see a lot, and and even even her, her mom, who we do see a lot, loves to see him anytime he's mm. got something new or did something new. And we prop it, prop the iPad up, and then they sit there and engage and talk and play with it. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, that's something that we did not have access to. And for me to be able to allow him to still have that interaction with them virtually is, is a pretty Dude, cool this thing. is just reminding yeah. me of something. So I texted, you know, this, this group thread that I'm in this morning, getting over here to work out, uh, was a bit of a nightmare. My two year old woke up hella early for some reason. He's waking up hella early. Jessica's nursing the baby. I got to get him. I'm trying to feed him. He doesn't want me to leave. He's crying. Jessica hasn't got her coffee yet. Without her coffee, she can't function. So I'm getting her coffee. This is going to all this stuff. And so I sent to this group thread, hey, like, oh my God, getting out of the house with a toddler and an infant is like a nightmare. And then one of my buddies was like, yeah, I got a two-year-old and, a, and, a, and, my, and my dog. And it's, you know, really hard. And I hate it when people compare <laughs> pets to kids. You ever have people tell you that? Oh, I got three dogs. I know what it's like. No, you don't. All the time. It's you don't know really, what it's like. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> Pets, you love your pets. It's all good. Not the same Dude, as kids. Pets, Stop saying you, that. Listen, please. you could just leave them in the house and then leave. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not all pets. Can you do that? Oh, you, <laughs> yeah. But, oh, but a lot of them you can. Yeah. Okay? If you train them or you put them in a cage. Yeah. You don't do that to kids. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, there's there's it's definitely levels. You don't, definitely pay, you different don't put levels. your kids down when they're really sick. No, you know there's different levels. I, uh, no. in, in the defense of the pet people, right? So we don't hammer all, all pet parents, right? Is oh god, Katrina and I have not had. You did not give birth you, to your pets. So no, call them no, pet no, parents. No, 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 no. So they, <laughs> it's a thing now, right? That's, that's how it happens. So we we have not had a dog for the first time in in twelve years now, and it's it's been what two months since Mozzie's passed, and I, I have to say there there is a lot less stress because it's it one of the hardest. It's very easy. We have enough family and friends that if Katrina and I want a date night, if we want to go somewhere. Everybody will raise their hand to take Max. Nobody hesitates, but nobody wants to take your fucking bulldog. And nobody <laughs> wants to watch your bulldog. Nobody wants to drive to your house and do this and like that. So it actually, in, in in their defense, I actually find it easier as far as so when we leave and do stuff is actually someone to help us with Max than to help with our pet. Listen, pets. That is a pain pets definitely a lot of work. You definitely care about them. That's part of the reason why it's challenging. But I hate when people come. No, they're to not kids, even. A, they're not even the same universe. That's just the. Okay, just I'm, I'm a pet guy and a kid guy now, and yeah. it's like they're not even the same universe. No, but man. I I have said to Katrina, you know, it's been nice. We've been able to <laughs> stay out late, and we don't have to hurry home because we're like, oh shit, Mozzie's been in the house all day, and like if we don't get home soon, he's either gonna chew something up or piss in the house, and so mm, we right. would find ourselves rushing home. You know, I gotta tell you guys, uh, talking about kids and all, you know, this, this all work and challenges. I did this tweet and uh, actually got some controversy underneath it, which. Is kind of cool because uh, that has hasn't happened yet but now i got some comments underneath and and this is the tweet that i said i love you guys' opinion on this uh i said a hard busy and challenging life is better than a boring easy life lacking any challenge that's the secret easy isn't better boring isn't better not being forced to grow isn't better it's torture and it's devoid of meaning don't fall for that lie and so i actually had people on there kind of trying to debate me and this and that about you know oh no easy is good and this and that and um, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I've always, I don't know. I guess that's always been sort of my mantra is, uh, just because of the value I've seen from, uh, approaching challenging, hard things. The, the other side of that is just so much more fulfilling. Uh, and, uh, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, we can, we can justify a lot in our own mind with, with, uh, the way that we do, we carry ourselves the way that mm -hmm. we like, so I, I could see how people would just want to be comfortable just want to be safe. And just, you know, I just want, uh, to live the easy life and, and to, uh, and to relax. And I mean, I'm sure you could kind of get in that mentality, but for me personally, I've always been much more drawn to something that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. It's going to force me to grow. It's going to, it's going to bring me to a new level I've never seen in myself. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I guess I, there's not a lot of, not everybody shares that, I guess. I, it's interesting how a life filled with challenges and struggle um, naturally creates purpose. When you don't have that, searching and finding purpose sometimes can be really difficult for people. I had the opportunity to hang out 
with a, a friend of mine that's a little bit older than we are. Like he's he's in his late forties, getting ready to turn fifty, and comes from a lot of money. Like he's t- tremendous. His family had tremendous success. He inherited a lot of it, and he did good things with it. Like he didn't squander it. He reinvested. And I mean, the dude has got everything. I mean, he's got all the toys. Can travel all over the place. Rental properties all over the country on a whim could pretty much do anything he wants. And um, you can, and we actually were having a conversation around a similar topic. And he made the comment of that, like, I I wish I had more adversity. And I think that's so interesting that, you know, so, and this is someone who's obviously later in their, they're now almost Mm -hmm. 50. They've gone through having all kinds of stuff and, and toys and play and travel. And yet, they 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 aren't seeking more things or more stuff they want they they were seeking adversity and mm. challenge and so i mean i also think it 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 uh it speaks to what we talked about with the whole um you know spartan and obstacle racing how there's something in us that i think we want that that war or that struggle or that challenge so much to the point that here we are paying to go beat ourselves up for three or four hours and climb through the mud and in the cold. And yeah. it's, it's kind of fascinating, but I think it's, I think it's in our DNA that we need it. It, it 100% is. There's a reason why uh, anxiety and depression is continuing to go up. It's continuing to go up when we are objectively, objectively life is far easier. We have more access to food and shelter and wealth and things work is far less demanding physically. It's not dangerous. Um, we, we live in very peaceful times. Life is actually is ex- incredibly safe. It's, and yet we're more depressed and anxious than ever. Now, I know what people say. Well, that's because we diagnose it more. Look, just look at the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Just the last 20 years, we continue to see this explosion. And it's because we make things... We, we, and by the way, I don't want to confuse people and say that efficiency isn't good. Efficiency is great. Mm-hmm. It's the challenge that I'm talking about. The lie is that a life devoid of challenge is better than a life that is full of challenge. That's false. That's, that's 100% false. A, a life devoid of challenge ultimately leads to hedonism because you're constantly searching to figure something out. And this is why you see these cra- these you know celebrities that get addicted to drugs and commit suicide when they have all this access well, to everything. And also too, it just, um, when you're in that kind of mentality of trying to, uh, remove yourself of challenges and, and create this sort of like easy going, you know, like safe kind of space when you are actually then presented, which inevitably you will be challenged yeah. again, you, you just can't avoid that in life. You're going to have challenges just thrown at you. You're, it becomes substantially greater because you don't have that kind of resilience. You don't have that muscle of overcoming these challenges. Uh, so it becomes all the more detrimental. Look, I saw, I saw my dad uh, get challenged with this. He retired because his body was just beat up and broken. Dude, you know how common this thing is that you're about to say I know. now is like I super know. common. So he worked very, very hard since he was a child, very poor, grew up very poor, worked his butt off uh, and worked for years and years and years and years, started developing lots of you know, just physical issues like arthritis in his spine, all sorts of stuff. So eventually he had to retire. He retired early and then he went through a long period of depression. When I remember when he was working so hard, he's like, oh, I can't wait till I don't have to do this anymore. Well, he didn't have anything to replace it, so he went from that to nothing. Now I'm at home all day long. Now what he's had to do is find ways to volunteer his time to go out and do things where he finds some purpose in his life. But you see this in, in retirees, people who say, oh, I want to retire and drink Mai Tais on the beach. No. Yeah. No. That actually will get old real quick. Real quick. And you'll mm-hmm. find yourself in a very, very bad place. You have to find challenge. In fact, growth doesn't happen unless you're uncomfortable. People are like, oh, I grow. No, you don't. You really don't really grow unless you're very uncomfortable. Otherwise, there's no, it doesn't, it's not, it's not going to happen. And, and I, I think another thing that I've found that um, uh, I've, I've always associated like, uh, you know, this crazy sort of painful process to it in terms of my mentality as I'm struggling, it's like, I'm going to like bear through this. And like, I don't have to have that mentality while I'm struggling. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I can, I can enjoy it and I can reframe it and I can like actually be like, Ooh, get excited about it because I know that, uh, I'm going to do better. I'm going to grow more as a human being on the other end of this. And so why not enjoy, you know, the process of instead of like dread it, bro, it's the difference between challenge, 
struggle and suffering. You don't have to suffer yes. through it, which is very different. So I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of people think suffering is what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, they associate about. that a lot. Yeah, no, not the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, I got to bring up a, a very interesting, I say interesting study because these studies come out and they crack me up because all those quote unquote old wives tales, they come back and they start to get proven right. So I remember being this dickhead, right? So <laughs> my mom would say to me, oh, put a jacket on. It's cold outside. You're going to get sick. Or, you know, don't go outside with wet hair in the, in the winter because you're going to get sick or whatever. And I, you know, know it all, you know, teenage Sal would be like, mom, that's not how the body gets sick. It comes from viruses and bacteria that doesn't have to do with anything. And this is what you would read in the medical textbooks and whatever. And, you know, you know, Mr. Smartass. And my mom's like, no, no, no. <laughs> if you get cold, you get sick. No, you don't. Whatever. Anyway, old wives tale. It's baloney. Actually, New study came out showing that cold air dramatically reduces the immune cells uh, in the in the nose and in the throat that can fight bacteria and viruses. Yeah. So it's being in the cold, defense. being in the cold, this is they think now why illnesses increase dramatically in the winter. It's because your immune system do you does know? get affected. So by being in the cold. My open. question would be then is in if I do a good job of training in extreme cold temperatures like the cold plunge, does it make me probably more resilient? You probably it? are teaching your body uh, to adapt. One hundred percent will think that. And I think uh, hundred because if your immune cells are getting affected, because it's really the change. That's right. If you look at the winter, when is the cold and flu season? It's when the when the when it changes, Shifts. not when you're deep into it, right? right. Because I'm sure- It's an abrupt change. Yes. So I think 100%. I think if you go throughout the year, you know, getting your body cold, like a cold plunge, mm -hmm. that you're probably going to get your body to adapt. So it doesn't get that, that you know, that reduction in immune ability when the, when the winter comes. So, How cool is that? No, it's super cool. Right, more studies. Uh, another study on creatine came out. Um, it improves memory. Why are we in, still doing studies on creatine? In, <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah, debate. Yeah. There's no debate anywhere anymore that it, how how effective it is. Yet we're still studying it. Like can crazy. we just replace you know your multivitamin with creatine? And, uh, well, I, I mean, they're going to put they're going to put creatine in or multivitamin. Gamut, right? so I think that's for sure. I mean, you called that a long time ago yeah. that we would see that in in basic health. Products. It's going to be everywhere. Here's the conclusion. This was a huge. I mean, um, you were talking about actually. You're starting to give it to your kids even now. I do. I give it to my kids now. Yeah. Every single day. So this is a huge meta analysis and it says the conclusion creatine supplementation enhanced measures of memory performance in healthy individuals, especially in older adults, 66 to 76 hmm. years old. So if you're older or you're listening right now and you have relatively healthy, um, you know, grandparents or whatever, and the reason why I say that is of course, if there's any organ issues, kidney issues, liver issues, and you might want to check with your doctor to take anything. But otherwise, um, they would be amazing candidates for supplementing with creatine and would notice uh, just profound benefits across the board, including improvements in your memory. Well, that's sort of the last straw for me because that's that's been uh, the biggest focus going forward is anything and everything I can do for uh, memory recall and for just improving brain cognition. I'm like, all in, like if I'm going to supplement, you know, it's probably going to be more in that direction. Have you, have you, you felt? just forget to take it? I just, forget. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't started yet. Obviously, <laughs> you know, we got creatine in there, by the way, in the closet. We do. Yeah, bro. I put, I keep, come on, you know, I take everything. You always take I have bro, everything dude. in there. You can take whatever's in there. All right. I'll, I'll go check everything, it out. everything in there. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, another interesting uh, study. Damn, dude. Hello studies. I got a great study. You got something Jeez. for a commercial seed or what? Should oh yeah. Save oh yeah. We'll get, we'll, we'll mention seed in a second. Damn, you got hello studies. No, check this out. This is uh, out of the University of Leeds. Here's the summary. Increasing, increasing intake of protein. Uh, is a way women could reduce their risk of suffering a hip fracture, according to new research. Food scientists have found that for women, a 25 gram a day increase in protein was associated with, on average, a 14% reduction in their risk of hip fracture. Is that w just by itself without even strength training? By itself. Oh, yeah. Well, now, I imagine think, if you, you add strength oh, training to that. Yeah, you add yeah, strength training, you're, I mean, that's massive reduction. Reinforcing and, it, yeah. Yeah. But I think what's happening is because women tend to under eat protein, mm -hmm. that that increase in protein did lead to a little bit of muscle gain, which then always leads to a strengthening strengthening of the bones. I mean, we, we yeah. had a call today, and I, I just, I'm glad we took that. It's been a while since I think we had that conversation. I just think that is the most common 
client that I used to get was the lady who called in. Um, where was she from? I don't remember what. what South Dakota. What, South Dakota. That's right. They called from South Dakota. I take great team. Um, <laughs> 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 that you, you, you're in this place of trying to lose body fat and get better shape. And you really, truly feel like you're making good food choices. You're keeping your calories low, like 14, 15 or less in her case. Um, and, and, and doing really good. You're consistently lifting weights three times a week and you're just not seeing the body change. And a lot of times, or if not almost all the time, it was, you know, they were, um, grossly under consuming protein yep. consistently. And it's like you, you were sending the signal to build muscle, but in this low calorie, low, almost, uh, you know, almost uh, less than 50% of your, you know, requirements of protein, you're not going to build, you're not going to speak. And the idea of that messaging that we talk about lifting weights to get strong and eating out. I mean, in order for you to build that muscle, to speed that metabolism up, you've got to give it the building blocks. Otherwise, in order to it's it. going to be really hard. Uh, otherwise, what you're yeah. mostly doing is just burning calories. Trying to build muscle on a low protein diet uh, is, is quite challenging. I've had clients like that for other reasons, and they will build muscle. They will get stronger in comparison when they don't lift weights uh, because that's the, the contrast. But it is profoundly different when they increase their protein intake. It is yeah. like the difference between low protein and adequate protein or optimal protein for building muscle is the difference between not lifting weights and lifting weights. Mm. That's how big of a difference yeah. it makes in people. Yeah. All right, one more study. And this is a controversial one. You ready? We're going to get people who are going to totally message us about this. But I didn't make the study. This was from MIT. Mm. Some people would say some of the smartest people in the world come out of MIT. Here's the summary. You ready for this? This is the controversy. A new study confirms that the planet harbors a stabilizing feedback mechanism that acts over hundreds of thousands of years to keep global temperatures within a steady habit habitual or habitable, excuse me, range. So in other words, oh, the Earth's wow. climate has undergone some big changes from global uh, volcanism to planet cooling ice ages and dramatic shifts in solar radiation. And yet life for the last... 3.7 3. billion so years has kept a natural on way to regulate this. Yeah, so this is MIT. MIT. Now, how much mm. how much pushback is this getting, in, or how much is it even being so talked, the, talked about? I've heard this. The people that counter the climate change alarmists are, are have been talking about this, and of course, the climate change alarmists. And I say alarmists, not climate change scientists. There's alarmists, and there's people that right. talk about climate change that uh, they're pushing back, of course, because a lot of people need to realize this. By by the way. This is a heavily politicized issue, meaning on either side you have uh, special interests that um, will take a narrative and run with it. Well, it well and it's increasing based off of what you've seen in the news from people like gluing themselves to walls, stopping traffic, like throwing uh, tomato sauce on like uh, priceless pieces of art. Yeah. It's like it's very much of a, a movement. Uh, that uh, is escalating right now. Yeah, my well, argument with the with the whole thing is that um, that life on Earth has has been built on industry. Um, we are a, a petroleum based, um, I guess, uh, species, right? So if you look at the discovery of uh, of oil and its use and all of its uses, because it's in, it's not just in in you know making cars drive and stuff like that. It's used in lots of medications, lots of you know textile, lots of different things that it really is connected to our growth and our and how we survive and all that stuff, that if you're talking about replacing that, you you have to talk about the loss of life that that switch is going to make. You have to have an alternative that it's like save, saving the, you know, okay, we're going we're gonna to reduce pollution, but in the meantime, we're going to kill all these people already on the brink who just came out of poverty in, you know, uh, countries in the world that are very susceptible. So, right. so this is the balancing conversation that needs to happen. And it's usually not that way. It's either like super extreme over here, super extreme over here, like over here, eliminate all well, there's oil. There's lots all the of talking points, Yeah, right? There's, there's, there's never uh, a shortage of talking points of like plans and solutions, but, uh, you know, I just pay attention to the actual, okay, so what, what are the actual actionable steps and who's actually innovating in that direction yeah. versus just talking hot air? Yep. Uh, and what are the actual facts? I mean, that's important, right? Like, cause it is an emotional thing that drives people. Like we, nobody likes to see pollution and nobody likes to think that we're just ruining our planet. Uh, so before getting emotionally struck by that, I, I always like to just kind of pull back and see, well, where, where actually could we 
center our focus to be most productive. Well, what makes me laugh is that when people say, oh, it's the, the, you know, the, the big bankers and all these, you know, they, they know, they know what's going to happen. It's like, well, why are they giving out 30 year loans on like coastal properties? Like, you know, big banks would not be doing that if they thought they were going to lose their, right. you know, the, the, these, these properties or whatever. So you said it already. That's, it's been politicized. I mean, it's, I, I feel like you can't even, um, you can't even quite much like when, when the uh, vaccine was going around, like you couldn't even question the efficacy of it or what we knew about it or didn't know about it because then you were an anti-vaxxer. It yeah. was like, mm -hmm. wait a second, I can't ask questions or be curious about- Are you going to put me way over here? Yeah. Like I also don't have to go in the- That's how I feel about climate change. It's like if you say like, well, you know, I think that we're going to innovate and, you know, we don't know. And there was a time when it was warming and then it was cooling. And then we've seen it kind of go back and forth. Like now all of a sudden you're, you're a denier of climate change. It's like, no, wait a second. I didn't say I'm mm -hmm. denying climate change. It's a fact. It changes we, we all the time. We recognize it's warming up. Yes. And, and there's changes. And we yes. may be playing a role. The question is, sure. what are the best solutions? that are not going to result in also another loss of life and is it as are the are the alarmists just doing that are they using fear to get of course people to act they're always ways? they're all on both sides right yeah. always there is going to be that way so it's yeah. uh, it's so all so right. funny to me when people get played into you know taking a hard stance on each one of these sides it's like dude you're just a pawn right now like in on the political side totally sure. when they're scaring the shit out of you that's when you know there's something they're trying to say i'm always alarmed when people use fear as their their main driver of information right yeah how many times have you heard this this is the most important election in history <laughs> i've heard that <laughs> every calm four years. down dude. <laughs> it's yeah. always the most important. Everybody calm down i know yeah. all right so let's talk about seed we're supposed to mention uh one of our sponsors seed you know what's funny about so seed is a a probiotic um and what makes it unique is the capsule that it comes in ensures that the the actual bacteria stays alive and moves through the digestive system and gets where it's supposed to. And this is why it's so damn, one of the main reasons why it's so damn effective besides the the strains of bacteria use. But anyway, have you guys ha put, had any family members try seed yet? Because yeah. I've had- My oh, sister does had great- Cassie yeah. does religiously. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so she's got gut issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's along, she's in line with you. Like she's had the opportunity to try so many different- Because she's had lots of gut brands, issues. And it was yeah. you who said like, uh, stand alone, this is the best. Because I think she was on, she would, was consistently using another brand. I don't remember what the brand was that made her hop over to seed. And now she swears by seed. Yeah, so. everybody I've had try it is like, I've never had a probiotic be as consistently good as this one. Like literally, if I take it, my gut is going to be okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, Courtney, had, uh, I think you know, I told you she had Hashimoto's mm -hmm. and had had to change in her uh, diet like real substantially. And, and uh, while she was going through elimination and then kind of repopulating, like she was using seed and that really helped. So yeah. I know I, I probably don't... Uh, use it the best the way I can. But I do, what I am good about is if it's like a Friday night and Katrina and I are ordering five guys and I know I'm going to have something that I know is going to mess my gut up and I proactively take it, it definitely mitigates the the feelings that I get after eating that food that would normally tear me up. So I, and I, I'm bad about consistently doing it every day. Like I get on a streak for a while and then I'm, I'm and then I like, like anything with the supplements. I'm, I'm, I'm not like you. I'm not consistent with taking them every single day like that as I should be, but I have gotten trained at least that I know like, okay, if we're ordering this, this burger, some fast food like this, that I know is going to upset my stomach. If I at least take this before, I know it makes a dramatic difference on my digestive process. It feels way better on me than had I not done that. Excellent. So do you guys have any uh, pages you want to shout out? I know we've been doing that. I, I do if you don't. Yeah, so, go for it. Yeah, please yeah so I, and you know, remind me too, this is, uh, when does this go live, Doug? On Tuesday, oh, let's so, see, the so this will miss. Okay, so this will miss the most recent one I did, but, um, you know, I've give, been getting tons of feedback on the conversations that I've been having with Chris Nagibi. Um, with the Higher Standard podcast. So he's become a good friend of mine. He's a banker, lawyer, and a real estate broker. And we do these, you know, once every two or so weeks, we'll get on my Instagram and we'll do a live story. We have a conversation around the Fed and the real estate markets and investing. And um, so if you're not giving him a follow already, I think he is a, a great follow. He, he was inspired by Mind Pump years ago. He's been a longtime listener of Mind Pump and our whole model of disrupting the health and fitness space and calling out a lot of the charlatans and providing 
really good, non-biased fitness information is what inspired him to do it in the financial markets. You know, uh, you know, his and he's the one who's made me more privy to a lot of these social media people that are famous for, you know, giving you financial advice as much of their advice is biased to their courses, their masterminds. And he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't sell anything like that. He's got he's very successful in what he does. And this is more of a passion project for him. So he is he's he's led with this the similar type of you know, a presentation with his space as like we did. And I think that his, his content's awesome. So Chris Nagibi, uh, his, is it, I'll spell his last name. It's N A G H I B I. So it's Chris. And then his last name, Nagibi. And, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, you introduced me to him and he's, he presents it very easy, very smart, very non-biased. Yeah. And his, and his podcast is cool. Um, they, they have a, they have a podcast called higher standard podcast. It is one of the ones that and all in are probably the two most uh, popular podcasts that I follow consistently. Hey, check this out. Do you want to go on a vacation, but also experience fitness hacks, biohacks? Would you like to use red light therapy? Have an Uller cool you off or warm you up when you go to bed? Use cold dip, sauna, a great gym, and also be surrounded by beautiful nature? Check this out. We have a property that we decked out with all of these incredible things. The, only the way that Mind Pump can, okay? You won't find this anywhere, and uh, we're renting it out. So if you're interested in getting the Mind Pump experience, in Utah, what's this town? Is it near Park City, right? Yeah. Near Park City is a great place to go. Email us at rentals at mindpumpmedia.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Steve from Ohio. Steve, what's happening, man? How can I help you? Hey, so how's it going? How's the baby, man? Oh, thanks for asking. Wonderful. Baby's doing great. Thanks. That's awesome. Adam, how's Max doing after his procedure a couple months in now? Yeah, yeah. No, he's doing great, man. It's been a, a world of a difference having him feeling good. Like uh, that that uh, almost year there where we were sick damn near every week was rough. So we've got a fun oh, phase yeah. right now. Three, year, three years old yeah. is pretty cool. Ooh, that's rough, man. I'm an empty nester, so I don't know how you guys do it having young ones. We're all about the same age. Oh, wow. Your kid's already out, huh? Yeah, but I, yeah, I got the boy. He just got out of the army. He's actually expecting here in March, so I'm about to be a grandpa. And here oh. you guys are with newborns. Oh man, <laughs> congratulations! Yeah, shit's wild, man. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess, like my email said, I feel best when I'm on a cut, probably less than 100 grams of carbs a day. But my my workouts definitely struggle um, as far as just strength and intensity levels and stuff like that. So. I guess I didn't really notice it until I went on my first cut and I was in phase two of anabolic. And about the same time I had lab work done with mm -hmm. Dr. Cabral. Um, and then everything just kind of clicked and made sense. I guess I didn't realize I was crashing until after I got my lab results. So they labeled me as a fast oxidizer and everything just kind of made sense. So I guess, I guess I'm looking on, I'm looking for your opinion on should I bump up fat to take care of the caloric deficit because I cut carbs or, or what would you do? Uh, good question. Okay. So explain the crash. What do you mean by that? You eat a meal with carbohydrates. So, How long afterwards do you feel like you're, you want to fall asleep? All quick, man. Like 45 minutes. Okay. So I'm similar to what you're talking about. So first off, you can bump fats to make up the difference with calories and you can build muscle on a lower carbohydrate diet, you will notice some performance drops from the lack of carbohydrates, but you could do pretty well with a relatively low carbohydrate diet that's higher in proteins and higher in fats. But let's say you want to bump the carbs, but you're like, man, I crash. What am I going to do? Well, here's what you do. You eat your carbs at night. Eat your carbs at night before bed. This is what I do. So throughout the day, I may eat around 75 to 100 grams of carbohydrates. And then uh, dinner time is when I have a larger carbohydrate meal. And it works out perfectly because then I go to bed and I sleep like a baby. And and studies actually show that eating carbohydrates an hour or two before bed actually does contribute to better sleep for a lot of people. So unless it causes digestive issues, in which case the advice will be different. But if that's not the case, then you can bump your carbs by having a carbohydrate meal about an hour or two before bed. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love that. There's not much I can add to that too. And he does have, I see it says on his notes that he has zero digestive issues. So the fact that you don't, I mean, 
loading up before bed and then that way and then i think you'll feel a difference in your workouts i actually think that totally you'll have better workouts because you did carb load you just did it at the the back so back loading carbs is what that is right so yep. and i've played with this before and i'm i'm not quite like you and sal in this situation i actually feel the difference when i'm i'm low carb going to work out so i i find that i have to have about 75 to 100 grams before i lift to get to really feel the benefits uh from them so for me i have to be a little bit higher carb but uh, this is great advice. I think just to switch them over towards the evening, and I think you'll feel a difference alone from that. Yeah, I, I'll eat a good 100 uh, grams of carbohydrates or more with dinner. And so what it typically looks like is I'll have my main dinner meal, and then I'll get up and you know I'll you know help get the kids ready or whatever, start doing the dishes a little bit. And about 30, 45 minutes later, then I'll start having some fruit, and that'll typically add another 20, 30 grams of carbohydrates. And then I'm winding down. You know, by this point, it's, uh, you know, like, you know, maybe 745, 8 p.m. I put the, you know, the baby down. I put, uh, you know, Aurelius down and um, I don't go to bed till about 930 or so. So then my wife and I hang out a little bit. I feel myself, my energy start to come down. I start to get nice and sleepy and I sleep like a champion. And uh, if you watch how I eat during the day, especially while I'm podcasting, I don't have more than like, you know, 35 grams of carbohydrates really throughout the day. It's not till later when I don't mind my energy uh, dropping. So give, I would say give that a shot. Now, have you also, have you have you played, I'm assuming you might've already tried this, but I I notice a difference on the types of carbohydrates and how I feel like that too, right? So totally, I will feel sluggish and sleepy if I have things like bread or pasta uh, like that, like you described 45 minutes later. But if I do have things like fruit or sweet potato, those things don't seem to make me crash like that. Have you noticed that? Are you like that or what, what's it like for you? Um, it's, it's kind of intermittent and it's weird because I don't necessarily crash all the time. It's just, it, it's different every freaking time. So, mm -hmm. but I do well with fruits and, and rice and potatoes. Um, but it just, and it's not even a very long crash. Like I might just crash for, it's a roller coaster. It's just up and down all day. I might crash for 20 or 30 minutes and then it's over with. And then I feel fine. You know what you might want to try? What might actually bring you some value is a CGM. Yeah, I knew you were going to yeah, say that. Sure. <laughs> yeah, because you, I knew it. Yeah, because you could see then uh, what is giving you these insulin, you know, spikes and crashes. Right. Because I look when we, you know, uh, we work with NutriSense, um, and they they have they work with CGMs and with uh, with you know nutritionists. And when I would look at my chart, the big spikes and drops, one hundred percent, is when I'd get those crashes. When I would eat carbohydrates that tend to not do that to me, then I would feel uh, much better. And so I identified for me which carbohydrates tend to make me. Uh, sugar does it for me. So if I eat like anything that's like processed sugar, I'll do it. Uh, and definitely gluten-containing carbohydrates will do it for me. But if I eat like white rice and I combine it with uh, protein and fat, not an issue. If I have oatmeal and, and let's say the carbohydrates are no higher than let's say 40 grams, then it tends to not. Uh, be an issue uh, for me. And then fruit, uh, whole fruit, not fruit juice, whole fruit tends to not be an issue, but it's going to be different from person. To yeah. Person. I think, I think there's tremendous value in at least where, like, I don't still wear my CG, but I think the wearing it for a little while, just to see those and just yeah. the, the, how individualized it's, it's so fast. It's fascinating at the, at the least to see, and maybe you can start to create some correlations between how you're feeling and what types of foods you're eating. Are you a, a coffee drinker as well? Do you do caffeine a, a oh, bit in the morning? Man, I've, I definitely have a caffeine problem. Okay. I'm not necessarily the uh, coffee so much, but yeah, I, I'm probably around a thousand milligrams. Oh, yeah. That's be, your crash, bro. Yeah, I was going to say, because that's usually <laughs> yeah, where I that, notice I mean, it the that, most. You're probably right, but maybe 700 on normal day. But if I feel like getting after it, then then I take the, the pre-workout and then, you know, that bumps at 350. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Like Steve, okay. The, yeah. See, so that's a good, I'm glad you asked crash. that. Yeah, yeah. Ju Justin asked you a key question there. That, that right. caffeine, caffeine, 100%. I'm going to make, I'm going to say right now is contributing to these. So roller coasters. I, I, not only that, you're like literally right at the number. Okay. So I have, my rule is when I go over 700. So as soon as I go over, cause what I've, what I've connected for myself personally is when I go over 700, Justin and I were literally just talking about this yep. the other day. I was telling him, like, dude, isn't it crazy when you start to push to the the your up, upper limit of how much caffeine you should have, the last caffeine drink actually makes me tired. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'll have a 200-something milligram rock star, but if it's, if it's the one that pushes me to 800 to 1,000, I almost feel sleepy after mm -hmm. it. 
And that's right. always my sign that I'm I'm hitting my threshold of caffeine and I know it's time to bring it all the way back down. And I bring it all the way back down to like one cup of coffee in the morning and I allow myself to reset. Steve, do this. Cut your caffeine down by a quarter and then start taking some rhodiola to kind of offset the red the, juice. The, the, yeah, so Organifi's red juice has rhodiola in it and, I love it, that. and it tastes good. So I would go a quarter for a week. You're going to feel shitty for about two, three days. And then the following week, cut it down a quarter again. Then the following week, cut it down a quarter again. Then stay there for a few weeks and then bring it up a little bit. And I, I bet you're going to notice a tremendous difference in your energy stability. Because that for sure, for sure, my energy does all kinds of weird shit when my caffeine gets high. It goes up and down and I'm Agreed. irritable and yeah, it's, it makes a huge impact. Right. And I've been on it for so long. I worked third shift for years. So it's, yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I you, don't you use the red juice. This is actually my favorite way to use the red juice is like as a replacement. So I yeah. actually, however many of those uh, energy drinks or coffees you're having, like, I actually still stay on the exact same habit. So like, so my routine is morning, I have my cup of coffee on my way to work, I get here, I have either another cup of coffee or an energy drink. And then I have a third one that's kind of like my habits. And so when I'm tailoring, yeah. when I'm tailoring off, I, I carve off the last one and it's mm -hmm. red juice. And then yeah. I do that for a while, like a while, like Sal said, a week or two. And then the, I carve off the second one with red juice. Yep. So I'm having red juice one day, then two, like, and it, it really mitigates the, the, uh, you know, pulling it out and doesn't feel like I'm crashing so hard. Yeah. Get resensitized again. It'll make you enjoy actually having caffeine again too. Cause I do the same thing. Like, because if I, and I noticed too, it'll, it'll start pushing its way into noon and then sometimes one o'clock. Uh, and then it starts affecting my sleep. And then it's this compounding effect after that, where like, you know, the, the tired feeling, uh, increases substantially. So that's just something I notice. And then too, like if I do have like a carbohydrate heavy meal, it really yeah. uh, bonks me out. Yeah. That's it right there, man. It's the, I, I think the caffeine is where I'd start to be quite honest with you. You can eat the carbs late at night too, or before bed, right. I should say, uh, you know, an hour or two before bed. But the, I think the, I'm so glad you asked that. That's the that's the silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right well, this there. is like okay. yeah, very familiar yeah. to what's good luck, to me. man. Caffeine's a hell of a drug. I'll tell you that. So. No, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it, guys. The positive side, though, is uh, you know it doesn't take that long no. to 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 kind of clear it out, and then mm -hmm. then you get the the amazing. Then it's a feeling. good time. Yeah, then it's fun again. So I mean, for that reason alone, you should. <laughs> yep. Sounds good. Thanks for calling in, All right, Steve. Steve. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, guys. You got it, man. That was a little nod to the Rick James on uh, uh, was a Chappelle show. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Caffeine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> Your couch. Yeah, um, bro. I am so glad I can't that if we didn't ask that question, he would yeah. have never figured out his problem. That was a major factor there. Because when my caffeine gets past a certain point, for me, it's four hundred milligrams. Uh, everybody's a little different. Yeah, one hundred percent. I get a roller coaster of energy throughout the day, and oh, yeah. when I bring it back down and reset, yeah, I feel like that, I'm great all day. So. It's funny too. I actually, what he's experiencing, I actually notice this. I actually, and and I, I start to think it's like the food Other stuff. Yeah. yeah, like the the food makes me feel all sleepy, but it is. It's and I have figured it out. It's seven hundred or so. Like as soon as I get above seven hundred. It's all downhill after that. I mean, it's yeah. or it's all bad after that. Like I have to go back the other direction, or else the last one, like it makes me sleepy. It's totally. wild. Yeah, it's funny too. When I resensitize myself to caffeine, if I do a good job and really stick to it, a hundred milligrams is amazing. It goes far. I mean, I can't even. Uh, you, you, I couldn't tell a hundred. You could throw a hundred milligrams at me right now. I wouldn't even notice. But when I'm sensitized, yeah, it's like a green tea, like a, just a regular green tea, and I feel like, oh my god, yeah, I'm so always amazing. so mad at myself. Yeah, I'm going through that process right now of like starting to kind of taper off that last one, especially. But like, because what naturally replaces it for me is water, and then I feel more hydrated, and the energy sustains longer too, yeah. as well. And it's like, <laughs> dude, that's know, that's such a, that's such a good point too, Justin. Like, that's another problem with the energy drinks and stuff is that it. it it does it replaces my water yep. intake and i already know i noticed a difference just from that like yep. i also get tend to get headaches and i think that has to do with the hydration also like there's so many things that most abused drug in the world is caffeine by far yeah our next caller is ryan from california ryan what's happening man hey how's it going good hey uh before i get started just what i want to say thanks i probably started listening like a year or two before covid you guys have such a positive message around fitness nutrition and just like family in general and how you go about business and just kind of like seeing different things in the world from different angles. So I think that's like really needed in, in uh, 2022. So thank you so much for that. Thank, thank you. you. Red. 
Yeah, so I, uh, my main question is just around uh, map split. I'm running that right now. And uh, currently, I'm riding my bike into work to try to save some money on gas. Uh, so it's about three and a half miles in the office, three and a half miles back, obviously. And I was wondering, like, map split. I'm two weeks into it and uh, was wondering, do I reduce the step count? Uh, phase one's like 10,000 steps. So do I reduce it? And if so, like how much? Or do I just keep that step count uh, consistent on top of riding that bike? Oh, so I, We got this question before, and the way I answer it to somebody who's like – already like stepping that much or more is to look at each phase and the percentage that we increase over phase and then just consider where you're at now is phase one your baseline and then your goal should be as you transition to each phase to increase by whatever that percentage is yeah, does that ryan, make sense ryan what's your goal yeah, totally. what's your growth what's your goal with with split uh what's your goal with the program yeah i mean long story short um I used to be 330 pounds. Now I'm around 220 and I've kind of gone up and down and I'm kind of like struggling, like trying to find that metabolism. Cause like I've done like mini bulks and like mini cuts. So like with split, uh, with the increased step counter and being like more active throughout the day by, you know, just walking around, um, trying to like reduce, uh, uh, body fat. Uh, and like, I always like to do it around the holidays cause it's more like, uh, harder challenge with like eggnog and like peppermint bark and all that stuff. So I like to challenge myself a little bit uh, harder from like Thanksgiving or Christmas. So I, I hopefully to reduce body fat uh, uh, during that program. Okay. So don't use uh, activity is a terrible way to try and lose weight. Now I'm not saying activity is not important or just moving yeah. is not important. It's good for health, but don't use mm -hmm. that as the, the fat loss tool, because if you do, you'll lose. Uh, and I don't mean lose body fat. You'll lose the, the battle. Because the body adapts yeah. very quickly to extra activity and, it's, and it ends up spiraling into this like crazy, like I'm doing all kinds of exercise more and more and more because my body adapted. So the, the diet is where you'll get the body fat loss. Because you're riding your bike three and a half miles to and from work, that's a, that's a decent amount of activity. Yeah. Um, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with even not walking uh, if you don't want to. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying if, it's, if your goal is body fat, then I wouldn't worry so much about like how much more I need to move in order to burn body fat. That comes from your diet. And honestly, if you push the activity too hard, I'm not, you're not doing this now, but you could get into a place where you're doing so much extra activity to continue to, you know, it adapts, your body adapts and you add more and then it adapts and you add more that you actually take away from the muscle building process that you're getting from the, the strength training program. And that'll kill your fat loss gains in the long term. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So did you, what are you following after split, by the way? Uh, I think I was going to do uh, probably strength and then probably going to like hit uh, split again right after strength. You mean strong, map strong? Strong, sorry, yeah. yeah. Do you have that program? <laughs> I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, good. I like symmetry. I think that's a good program that everybody should run at least once. And then because you're doing so much biking, um, it's a good idea because it's such a repetitive movement. I do like maps prime pro for correctional work. So that'd be something else that I think would be a value for you, but I'll send you symmetry. Do you have symmetry? If you don't, I'll send it to you. I don't. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it too. Cause like I tore my rotator cuff, uh, in college. So like now I'm all like lopsided. So I definitely know mm. I can feel it sometimes. So I try to really do, you know, like Bulgarian split squats and like, uh, single arm like bench yeah. and things like that with the dumbbells to try to like even it out but i haven't done a, a dedicated program to that kind of thing okay good so i'll send you symmetry and then you know i do think prime pro would be valuable too well awesome thank you guys i really appreciate it no problem man All thanks right. for calling in let's look right, have a good one <laughs> yeah yeah we put the steps in there really just to increase somebody's movement but you do got to be careful at using movement as a way to lose body fat it's a losing strategy. It doesn't work very long. And then you're stuck in this position where you're doing a hell of movement. Your metabolism tends to adapt. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, uh oh, now what happens when I stop? And you get in this like downward spiral. Always good to, to bring that up because I, I, I really do feel like that's still the common thought uh, process. And yeah. what's being marketed the most is to to be able to um, increase activity, increase cardiovascular output. Uh, that's going to be your best way to, to shave down the body fat when in fact, you know, focusing more on, you know, your nutrition and just, you know, u utilizing um, resistance training for what it's best at. Uh, uh, strength and, and muscle building is where to go. Well, the real thought process 
behind the the step goals for people was really to to model it similar after uh, like how I would coach a a, a competitive client. Where, yeah, because it's a bodybuilding program. Yeah, and the idea was I would encourage more frequent low you know intensity type of movement throughout the day before i would like say get on the treadmill and go for an hour and run or do the elliptical it was or more lifestyle with. yeah it was more lifestyle based now if you already have a lifestyle where you're very active uh th this is less important right mm -hmm. because this person is riding a bike to and from work which is very very active in comparison to the average person and then if he's also walking quite a bit it doesn't mean he still can't use the formula of the percentage of steps like i recommended to him but it becomes less important to somebody who's all, who's starting off at 15 20,000 steps a day it really is ideally to encourage the average person that wants to sculpt their body to utilize just walking and moving throughout the day before they start scheduling this you know hour routine of cardio which is less likely to be sustainable right it's more likely that if you if i can encourage a client to walk after a meal or get up in early in the morning go for a nice little half hour walk or end their day with a half hour walk it's more likely that they will maintain something like that for the rest of life versus, hey, I want you to yeah. do an hour of the Stairmaster after your workout every day. Like that's less likely for them to, to stick with consistently. Our next caller is Christine from South Dakota. Hi, Christine. How can we help you? Hey, thank you so much for having me on, guys. You got it. Yeah. I would be remiss to not uh, tell you how much it is just appreciated for what you do, your wealth of information, and uh, just everything that you share with people is truly awesome and how much you guys have uh your candor and your transparency through it all is really appreciated i feel like that's kind of lost in society so thank you for having that oh, thank, thank you. you yeah so i guess i need to uh just start with my basic question which was um when i wrote in sorry i'm looking for it i'm wondering if there is ever a time a person has to realize that lifting isn't the best way to drop weight and one must actually add more cardio instead I feel like I've listened enough to assume that the answer is lift. However, I'm continuing to gain weight uh, while I still do lift three to two, uh, two to three times a week. I am currently at my heaviest, um, even after two pregnancies, and I wouldn't care what the scale says if I didn't have such a high BMI, uh, which is currently 30%. So I'm just wondering if I should be adding some kind of like running or rowing or something to the beginning or the end of my workout. Christine, this is a great question and you remind me of the majority of clients yeah. that I used mm -hmm. to train who would experience something very similar. So um, I'm going to be very, very clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, workouts are not great for, for, for weight loss. Lifting weights is great for building muscle. Now the side effect of which is a faster metabolism, which lends itself better to weight loss. Cardio is a great way to get healthy, not a great way to, um, to, to lose body fat. It does burn calories. However, your body adapts very quickly to it. So build muscle, improve your health, and also improve your health with cardio. The reason why you're having trouble with weight has not to do, or really very little to do with your workouts and has almost everything to do with your nutrition. It's your diet. So if you want to lose body fat or lose weight, don't try and work it off with more workouts. Now you can work out more if it improves your health and makes you feel better. That's not only perfectly fine, that's great. But when it comes to weight loss, look at your diet. That's where you'll find the answer, and that's where we get the results you're looking now, for. Now let, let's let's speculate a little bit here, so and and see if we can if we can maybe hit home on some stuff. Now this is a very common uh, situation for clients. Like I the, the, I think I've spoke to this morning. Else now, what is most common when I get somebody in this situation, especially when they get kind of frustrated, like man, I feel like my diet's good, Adam. I make good food choices. I don't go eat fast food. I don't eat sweets. I don't do all these things. Because obviously, if those things were in there, it would be very probably obvious to you, like, okay, you probably need to cut some of that bullshit out. But what tends to happen is my my female clients that that want would like to see weight go down the scale, they believe in me, they trust that strength training is the better way to go to dispute their metabolism. The area that I almost always see they are missing is the consistency around protein intake. Mm -hmm. And that is why they're not seeing the benefits of the strength training like they would like to see. Because what they're doing is they're feeding their body low calorie. They're eating good choices as far as like they're not eating bad foods. They're eating healthier choices. But then when I look at their macros, their protein take is, is so low that they're not building very much muscle from the weight training. The only benefits they're really getting from the weight training is the calorie burn. 
burn, which is hardly anything when you weight train. So what's happening is they feel like they're eating good. They feel like they're following my protocol of strength training and they're looking back at me going, Adam, I'm just not getting any leaner uh, and I'm not feeling like the scale is moving, but I feel like I'm making good choices. I'm following your weight training program. And then I dive into the diet and I go, well, you know, when was the last time you strung two weeks together of hitting your protein intake every single day? And rarely ever can they say, you know what, Adam, I am doing that. And I go, well, what's happening is you're sending a signal to build muscle by lifting weights. But the problem is you're not giving it the building blocks in order to build the muscle in order for it to speed up your metabolism and in order for it to help you lose body fat. So that without knowing any more details or even asking you, that is probably the most common thing that I see with somebody in your situation. Does that hit home at all? Oh yeah, you're spot on. And I um, have been recently trying to track a little bit more. It was always just calories. And then the macros thing is new to me. Um, but I, I listened enough to know that my body weight in grams of protein is what I need to aim for. It just seems like a lot to eat. Um, so I'm aware of that and I'm trying. So it's usually eggs and um, either ham or prosciutto or something for a meat uh, in the in the morning. Um, and then almost always a salad with chicken or ham or turkey. Deli meat is kind of my go-to. So I may be missing it there with the kind of protein I'm grabbing. Um, well, if you're, no. if you're having, how many eggs and how much prosciutto are you having in the morning for breakfast? Uh, one or two eggs and two slices of prosciutto. Cause that's a okay. lot of sodium. Yeah. So let's say, that's let's like say, I don't know what your body weight is, but let's say the average female and you weigh, let's say 140 pounds. Okay. So 140, uh, you're looking at, you're going to need to have a good, I don't know, 40 something grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What you just told me is like 12 grams of protein. So those are protein foods. By, by the way, this is the ex I'm 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 helping yeah. right now my sister in law right now. Um, and and this is her exact struggle. Right, is as I'm looking at her diet and, you know, and and it, what the hardest part for her is she'll do it for a little bit. She'll do it for like a week or two for me, and then she'll you know holidays happen, and then she reverts back to her eating habits. And unfortunately, muscle takes a while. It's not like instantly. It's not like you eat like your protein intake for one week and all of a sudden you slap on 10 pounds of muscle. It's a very slow process. And the most important thing I tell her is right now, I need you to hit that protein intake consistently. Breakfast is where she struggles. It's where most people struggle. So what I tell her is like, listen, dinner is easy for her. She loves ground turkey, beef, steak, all the all those basic dinner meals. But I'm like, you need to leave some of the leftover from dinner and that needs to become breakfast mixed with eggs. So I'm like, take your one to two eggs and mix it with four to five ounces of beef, chicken, steak, whatever your meat is that you have for dinner to make sure you start your morning with 40, 50 grams of protein so you stay ahead of your goal. Otherwise, you're playing yeah. catch up all day and then you never hit and, your And this intake. can be, and a whole foods is the best way to go, yeah. but this can be where protein shakes can be helpful because mm -hmm. it is challenging for, for people, for a lot of people to eat the right amount of protein. But do you know what your calorie targets are? And do you, are you started tracking? What do you look, what do you, what are you tracking? Yeah, so far? I did an in-body scan. This is actually over a year old and that one said 1317. And then I, uh, now I'm on fitness pal. If I grab out my phone is 1400. That's what you're so, eating or that's your goal? What I'm eating because okay. that's what I thought my goal was. Okay. So you're aiming for 1400 calories a day. Mm -hmm. are, like, are you hitting it? Yeah, or under. Yep. Okay. And then the weekends, of course, because I this is identical. I'm a human You're being, and it's the weekends, and I will go out or I'll. Okay, so yeah, so Christine is <laughs> identical. <laughs> this is identical to my sister in law right so, now. So Christine, check this out. Okay. Let's say Monday through Friday, you're hitting your target of 1,400 calories, which puts you at a 500 calorie deficit each day, meaning you're eating 500 less calories than you're burning. Okay, so the, so we're we're now going to start tapping into body fat. So that's Monday through Friday. So you had a total of 2,500 calorie deficit Monday through Friday. But now Saturday and Sunday come along. And instead of eating 1,400 calories on Saturday, very easy to eat 2,500 calories on Saturday. Again, very easy to eat 2,500 calories on Sunday. You've now taken your deficit of 2,500 calories for the week and brought it down to 500 or less. Now that means it's going to take you something along the lines of seven weeks to lose a pound of body fat. Okay. Not, not, because the weekend erased a lot of what happened uh, during the week. So if you do track, you got to be consistent every single day, stick to the strength training. And if your strength is going up, what's going to follow is your metabolic rate. 
So, and, and hit those protein targets first. So out of the 1400 calories, figure out where your protein should be at. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your body weight. If your body fat percentage is high, you can use a target for your target body weight. So let's say you weighed 160, but you're like, I want to weigh 130, make it 130 grams as your target and aim for that and then make up the rest with carbs. Not only, fats. not only that, Sal, you know how hard it is to hit 130 to 140 grams of protein within only 1300 calories. No, very hard. It's almost impossible. It's all, it, you'd have to be almost on the carnivore diet in order for that to even mathematically mix. So this is literally where my sister-in-law is at. Like you, I'm, I need to link you guys two up so you guys can talk to each other. And <laughs> she, yeah, she, <laughs> she would like it. Cause I'm, I'm much harder on her just so you know, I'm like really tough on her about this because I'm like, God, you've known me for so long and you still struggle with this. And you've heard me talk about it so many times, but I get it. I understand. Yeah. It leaves like know, 800 calories for carbs or fats. I just did the math. Yeah. It's like almost impossible. Like, it, like you think about the meats, you would have to be eating lean meat all day long with nothing else to almost hit that so she she was in the same area and so i actually have i push her up to 1800 calories and i've told her stay off the scale i don't give a shit about the scale right now our one and only goal is to eat when you're hungry hit your protein intake lift weights and then and let's be consistent with that and i'm like i'm asking for a month i'm like give me 30 days of you hitting your protein intake, like I tell you, every single day, not missing one for 30 days and not lift, missing your workouts three times a week. And I promise to God, I will show you something. You will feel a difference. Your metabolism will speed up. You will feel it. You will see it. But I just got to get you to be consistent for those 30 days at hitting that protein intake. It's so important. Yeah. Christine, do you have my book, The Resistance Training Revolution? I don't. Okay. I th it's, it would be really helpful. Get it. Very easy read. And in okay. there, I talk a little bit about this, and it'll give you some guidance on on both diet and what to expect with good resistance training. Now, I'm not opposed to cardio. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not a great way to, like, it's not going to solve the weight loss issue, but it will help with your health, especially if you're sedentary. Ideally, ideally, it's just walking. So you're going to do your two days a week or so of strength training or three days a week of strength training. And then on on every other day, I you know <clears throat> aim for eight to 12,000 steps just through walking, you know, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that kind of stuff, and and you'll be pretty good. So. I, I want to give you access to our forum for free too. I'd like you to be in there so I can check up on you, and you could give me give me a heads up on your progress and stuff. So, yeah. if, if how you, long have you yeah. been at this, by the way, Christine? How long have you been trying? Well, I've been. I was trying to figure this out. I think it's been about five years that I've just been intermittently working out. So, not saying I'm super consistent, but I've had a let's just say I've had, I've had a gym membership for five years. Okay. Um, and some days, some weeks, some months are like spot on, and then there's some that aren't. Um, so putting that out there. But the thing that's bothering me is the last two years, it's just been like my belly is just right. I can't I can't stay lean and fit. Um, so I just feel like it's kind of been this abrupt, I mean, in two years I've gained 13 pounds and I, nothing in my life has changed dramatically, not my diet, not, you know, I haven't had a child in nine years, things like that. So that's what really is bothering me. It's like, why am I going up when I've been doing the same thing for so long? Some, like, something changed. You just, you, you might not be able to perceive what's going on, but something changed. I know the last two years, a lot of people gained weight. Yeah. Um, and there's, there, and it doesn't take much. You do 13 pounds over the course of two years. It's like an extra 75 calories a day well, or something like that. Well, especially when your metabolism is that low. When, yeah. you're, when you're only allowed to eat 13 or 1400 calories, it does not give you a lot of yeah. metabolic and, flexibility. And the I reason mean, why you poor thing, you have one one night with the girls or have a, a night out to dinner and you have a little dessert or something and it probably feels like it sticks right to you yeah. because of how slow the metabolism and, and is. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. The reason why I'm saying this is because uh People can often, it can feel terrible. Like what is going on? I don't know what's happening. There's something there. It's not like a, a mystery in the sense of like, there's like your body just all of a sudden changed and now wants to gain a ton of body fat, but it just doesn't take much. It doesn't take much of a change to, to cause that accumulation over the course of two years. How long have you been consistent with your two to three days a week of strength training recently? Like how long have you, how many weeks have you strung together? Oh, um, I mean, since the summer i mean it's Excellent. been definitely this summer trying to cram in lots of workouts to look good this summer and then well, i didn't go Do very you have, well but and then moving forward are you following any of our programs uh my husband's got a few and i tried anesthetic and it was a lot Too and much. i just didn't have that yeah. kind of time or ability Too quite much. frankly I, so maps 15 is what i have my sister-in-law right i'm going to send you maps 15 that's what i have my sister -in -law. and i'm going to also send you uh maps starter i think those are going to be i think those are the programs you should 
you should do right now. But I'm going to send you maps 15. After that, map starter will be good. Maps anabolic pre-phase will be good after that. But let's do maps 15. And you could do most, you could do all the workouts at home. You don't even have to go to the gym uh, to do them. And it's 15 minutes every single day, which basically will equate to like two 50 to 60 minute workouts a week. So except it's 15 minutes a day. And you may find, many people find that they're way more consistent doing 15 minutes a day versus going to the gym twice a week for an hour. So I'm going to send that to you. And then let us know what happens in the forum. I want yes, to follow up with you. Stay on the forum. And 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 I want you to worry more about protein than I actually do want you to worry about calories right now. Just really focus on hitting. And, and, the, and the questions that I'm looking for from you is the same ones that I, like my sister's like, oh, Adam, at this time of day, I have a hard time getting this, or this is the normal meal I have. And then I would help her modify it so it would be a better protein meal, kind of like we just did with you where you're already having one to two eggs and a little bit of meat. I would say I like the idea of taking some eggs with some meat, but I like the idea of carrying over from dinner the night before where you had probably a big, more meat focused meal into your breakfast and to kickstart your day. Yep. I also love the uh, protein oatmeal. I just shared in the story today that I'm I'm taking using as our creatures of habit. It's got 30 something grams of protein. So that's normally what I have her doing if she's not doing the, the meat and egg things. That's a good start uh, for her day, stuff like that. So yeah, get in the forum, give us feedback on on the stuff that you're having challenges with, and then hopefully we can work together through it. That's awesome. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. No problem. Christine. Thanks for calling. Yeah, have a good day. You got it. Boy, I tell you what, how many people have no idea what high protein is? Uh, you know, like how many times that happened to you with a client? We're like, no, no, I eat, I eat a lot of protein. It's like, well, what do you have? Well, I have a a turkey sandwich for mm -hmm. lunch because there's turkey in it. It's high protein. It's and you're so, like, that's or they don't grams. even consider it. Like they just consider eating healthy. Food, that's right. Yeah. That, which is most is, common for that me. That is what's happening. And that's, it's, it's like, uh, it's so I, man, I, and I feel for her because this is such a frustrating place to be totally. when you really feel like you're, you're making a lot of sacrifice. You're saying no to the drinks. You're saying no to the dessert. You're making good food choices whenever you can. And then you're also exercising three days a week, you know, and, and you're not seeing how frustrating that can be. But it, nine times out of ten, it is the, the the that client of mine that is just not consistently hitting their protein intake, and you have to understand how important that is in conjunction with the strength training. If all you do is strength train, but then you eat 20 to 40 grams of protein every day. Oh, that's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough for yeah. the body to build muscle. And it, yep. and it doesn't help that you go to the grocery store and you're like, but I buy the high protein cereal and the products. and But you know, yeah, I know better. I look at, options. yeah, I look at the back and it's like five grams of protein. Like this is called high protein. Yeah. Like that does, that's not high protein well, you at just, all. You or just, Starbucks, like they, they have like the protein meal and it's only like 10 grams or so. Well, you yeah. hit, you hit it even though you were actually still way under, uh, you said, you know, she needs to be 40, 40 grams of protein breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That doesn't even do it. No, that's 120. That's, that's 120. Yeah. She needs uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack at 40 to really hit that one, 140, 160 range and it, there's not a lot of people do that yeah no nope. so that that is that's important and and, and i know there's going to be somebody who's listening like oh you don't have to hit that of, of course you don't the reason why i give that boy does it make it a lot easier though yeah and 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 the reason why i give a target like that is because i know the inevitable is going to happen yeah. she's going to have days where she falls short at 120 140 but the problem is if she it works it's hard for her to get to 100 then she has a lot of days where she probably hits 20 to 40 grams in mm -hmm. a day. That ain't enough. Mm -mm. You ain't going to build muscle that way. You got to make sure you're getting that, that adequate protein while you're strength training to speed that metabolism up. Check this out. If you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal, and they're all free. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is also on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out, and less injury. That's another yeah. thing you'll see less injury as well.